Tensions in the Indo-Pacific, preparations for possible military action speeding up. We look at what's happening. A key part of Taiwan's most advanced anti-ship missile ending up in China for repairs. The island immediately running security checks and scanning for data leaks. A Chinese columnist cheers debate over the House's incoming speaker. Could the chamber's planned action on China fall apart if McCarthy fails his bid for the gavel? The European Union boosting border control rules for arrivals from China. And Philippines-China talks ending in new agreements. The Philippine president meeting with Beijing's premier and top leader. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In the Indo-Pacific, preparations for possible military actions seem to be speeding up on multiple fronts. China, Taiwan and the U.S. are boosting defenses. Worth noting, Washington is Taiwan's strongest international backer and main source of arms. Let's dive into some updates. China's 2022 defense budget increased more than 7 percent year on year. It's also more than doubled over the past 10 years since Chinese leader Xi Jinping came to power. For years, Beijing has been sending warplanes to fly near Taiwan almost daily. Incursions by Chinese fighter jet and bombers into Taiwan's air defense zone almost doubled in 2022 compared to the year before. The largest intrusion involved 70 aircraft within 24 hours. It happened during the last week of the year. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, claims Taiwan is part of Chinese territory and has vowed to take it over by force if needed. The island enjoys its own democratic constitution and has never been ruled by the CCP. To help the island cope with rising Chinese aggression, the U.S. has approved weapons sales to Taiwan worth tens of billions of dollars under both the Trump and Biden administrations. The last U.S. arms sale to Taiwan got greenlit at the end of last year. It features $180 million for anti-tank equipment. What's more, in December, U.S. President Biden signed a defense bill authorizing up to $10 billion in military aid to Taiwan. On top of those changes, beginning in 2024, the island will extend the length of mandatory military service. Taiwanese men will have to serve one year instead of four months. The move lines up with official statements that the island will work to defend itself. The expansion of China continues to impact the international order. Taiwan wants to tell the world that between democracy and dictatorship, we firmly believe in democracy. Between war and peace, we insist on peace. Taiwan is home to 24 million residents, just one sixtieth of China's population. Tensions between Taipei and Beijing present a complicated situation. Taiwan is closely tied to China in many ways, not just economically, but also militarily. Concerns arose on the island Wednesday after a key component of the island's most advanced missiles turned up in China. The weapons are called carrier killers. A key device used to calibrate them was shipped to a manufacturer in Europe for repairs, but was then returned to Taiwan from China. The missile device was sent to China for repairs by a Swiss company that operates a maintenance center there. Taiwan's missile developer said no data had been leaked after checking the returned device. But experts say Taiwan must be careful. The island is discussing measures to avoid similar equipment being maintained in China. The leader of the world's largest military alliance is sounding the alarm. The issue? Western economies' dependence on China. On Thursday, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg warned that over-reliance on Chinese products would, quote, make us vulnerable. We shouldn't make the same mistake when it comes to other authoritarian regimes, especially China. We cannot make ourselves so dependent on commodities and products from them that it makes us vulnerable. We must prevent that. We export technology to them that they then use to threaten us with. We need to strengthen control of our infrastructure, from ports and airports to 5G networks. Stoltenberg further called on the West to invest in security. 
he noted, quote, nobody is saying that we shouldn't trade with China. But what is important is that we do it in ways that don't undermine our security. His warning came as Russia mobilizes new forces against Ukraine. Stoltenberg also said not to underestimate Putin's ambitions. A former NATO leader is also sending a message to the Western world. It's about a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. He's urging NATO member states to show China severe economic consequences if Beijing chooses to invade the island. Here's his comment. Any attempt by China to change the status quo in Taiwan by force should spark an equally unified response. And we must make this clear to China now. The former NATO Secretary General made the remarks during a visit to Taiwan today. He drew a parallel between Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's military aggression towards Taiwan. The Chinese Communist regime has sent Air Force missions near the island almost on a daily basis over the past three years. The former NATO head also said that democratic countries must work in unity to help Ukraine win. That's in order to deter a Chinese attack on Taiwan. A columnist for a Chinese media is cheering the current fight in Congress. Kevin McCarthy failing to secure enough support to become the House Speaker after several rounds of voting. The opinion piece was posted on Chinese media outlet Guancha. It suggests that McCarthy failing to become Speaker of the House could spell good news for China. McCarthy has pledged to take action regarding China once he's elected Speaker. That includes taking a tough line on Beijing and spearheading a House Select Committee on China. He also plans to visit Taiwan if he gets the gavel. The opinion piece said those plans are likely to fall apart if McCarthy doesn't become Speaker. Australia boosting its long-range strike capability with the purchase of a U.S. missile system. The effectiveness of the HIMARS uh, system in the Ukrainian conflict has certainly influenced uh, the government's decision here. HIMARS is the same long-range military technology Ukraine is using in its war against Russia. But for Australia's defence focus, China seems to be the target. It's also something where we, as an ally of the United States, can support their efforts and air force posture in uh, uh, the Pacific region as well. Last year, China signed a security pact with the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. The move heightened Australian and U.S. concerns about China's assertiveness in the region. According to the Australian government, the HIMARS system will include launchers, missiles and training rockets and will be used by 2026. The Australian Army will be going from having an ability to strike targets 30 kilometres away to eventually being able to strike targets at ranges greater than 499 kilometres. The system is part of Australia's over $700 million budget for new missiles and rockets. The European Union is strengthening border controls towards arrivals from China. On Wednesday, an EU Commission spokesperson said the overwhelming majority of EU member countries favor a new measure. That is, virus testing passengers from China before they can board a plane. On top of that, the EU has set out a number of other rules and would like to see its 28 member states putting them into practice. But for now, it's not a mandate including recommended mask wearing on flights from China. It will also include things such as waste mo wastewater monitoring for aircrafts, genomic surveillance at airports and increased monitoring and sequencing, increased EU vigilance on testing and vaccination. But the situation may change quickly. Sweden said in a statement that travelers from China need to be prepared for decisions being taken at short notice. Sweden holds the EU presidency this year. The first foreign vaccine doses being used in China, but they're not for Chinese citizens. German nationals living in China can receive their first dose or booster of the German-made BioNTech jab starting Thursday. I think I'm among the first ones in the German community here to get a booster in China. 
Whether it's too late or not, it's the only chance I've got, and no one knows how long it will be available. So now is the right moment for me. Willendorf explained he couldn't go back to Germany to get a booster shot because China's travel ban has made a trip abroad impossible. Germans over the age of 12 can access BioNTech in five cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Xinjiang, Guangzhou and Chengdu. About 14,000 German nationals live in China, and more than 8,000 doses of BioNTech vaccine have been shipped. The deal allowing that was made during the German Chancellor's November trip to Beijing. That followed Berlin's clearance of Chinese vaccines for Chinese nationals living in Germany. China hasn't yet approved the widespread use of any non-Chinese vaccines, despite soaring infection rates. U.S. computer maker Dell plans to stop using China-made microchips by 2024. It also told suppliers to reduce the amount of other made-in-China components in its products. Let's take a closer look at the change. The company has concerns over U.S.-Beijing tensions. It told suppliers late last year that it aims to meaningfully lower the amount of China-made chips it uses. That includes chips produced at facilities owned by non-Chinese chip makers. The move is the latest example of how the U.S.-China tech war is speeding up tech companies' efforts to move production away from China. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is visiting China this week. On Wednesday, he met with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and later Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. We already have between our two countries a um, hundred uh, agreements between uh, the Philippines and China. We are uh, going to sign close to a dozen in the, on this trip and uh, that uh, bodes well. And uh, perhaps uh, this, this will be the beginning of our partnership as we face the new normal, we face the new post-pandemic global economy. After that meeting, Marcus met with Xi directly. The two leaders agreed to set up direct communications between their foreign ministers on the South China Sea. That aims to handle disputes peacefully and cool security tensions. Beijing lays claim to much of the disputed resource-rich sea. The Philippines has raised concerns about Chinese construction there and about dozens of Chinese vessels swarming its boats. Marcos and Xi agreed the Chinese and Philippine Coast Guards would meet as soon as possible to discuss cooperation. Other agreements include resuming talks on oil and gas exploration in the South China Sea, cooperating on areas like solar, wind, electric vehicles and nuclear power, boosting tourism and flights between their capitals to pre-pandemic levels, and cooperating on vaccine distribution. On the economic front, Beijing agreed to let in more Philippine imports. The countries also renewed a deal under China's Belt and Road Initiative. That's Beijing's main overseas investment program for infrastructure. What's more, the nations plan to hold an annual dialogue on security and reaffirm the importance of freedom of navigation. Both countries would also consider informing each other when firing rockets and cooperate on the retrieval of rocket debris. World tournaments for women's tennis might not return to China in 2023. The return of Women's Tennis Association tournaments to China this year will hinge on the case of a former Chinese tennis star. The WTA governs the women's game. The association said Wednesday it still had not met with former doubles world number one Peng Shui personally. Peng accused a Chinese former vice premier of sexual assault in 2021 in a post on Chinese social media. Her post was soon removed from the internet. Peng's post caused an international outcry over her safety. The WTA called for an investigation into Peng's allegations and suspended tournaments in China. The move possibly costing the women's tour hundreds of millions of dollars in broadcasting and sponsorship. Looking at the 2023 tournament calendar, there are no events scheduled for China, at least for now. In a statement, the WTA said it hopes to operate events again in China, but will not compromise its founding principles, adding its return to China will require a resolution to the Peng situation. As tens of thousands leave Hong Kong for new lives abroad, many are craving a childhood favorite drink, 
It's become a symbol of the city's culture and is even part of the city's resistance movement. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the beverage. The tea is called Sasan Tang. The beverage is sweet and heavy with evaporated milk. Now workshops are popping up to teach professionals to brew the beverage. Milk tea is very important to the Hong Kong people because since we were small, we went to Cha Chan Tong with our parents to drink milk tea and have breakfast, eating macaroni and toast. Eric Tam is a 41-year-old manager at an insurance company. He now lives in the UK. I lived in Hong Kong for decades. It would be wrong for me to say I don't miss Hong Kong. I can't fully merge into the British local culture so soon. I always think about Hong Kong. Milk tea definitely helps me reminisce about a part of Hong Kong's taste. Tam moved to Liverpool with his family in June. But before Tam left, he signed up for lessons at the Institution of Hong Kong Milk Tea. He says that milk tea is a form of silent resistance. To a certain extent, it's keeping our identity as Hong Kongers. When we can keep this food culture and our preference for milk tea overseas, it's like being in a part of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's protest movement has even called itself part of a milk tea alliance. Following a law that silenced or jailed most political opposition, over 130,000 residents have secured a special visa. The document allows them to live and work in the UK and apply for British citizenship after six years. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what's coming up in our second half. China will open its borders this weekend, allowing Chinese citizens to travel abroad. Should this concern other parts of the world? We spoke to Chinese virologist Dr. Yin Li Meng and former White House Coronavirus Task Force member Dr. Scott Atlas for insight. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.